And uh, welcome everybody to our Green Dialogue on October 4th, 2023. And um, before we get started, we, we do have a special guest with a presentation today. Um, before we get started, does anybody have any quick announcements that they would like to share? I want to encourage people to check out the latest Green Gazette. There's info on the um, Eco Home Tour this Saturday. There's a bike tour. Uh, thanks to Sarah, we will be at the market from nine to noon. And um, we have a guest from Absolute Solar who will be there answering questions about the solar system on the market and the next Solarize workshop. Um, and then Ned Jackson. Say the whole solar system is on the market? Yeah. There, <laughs> there is on the utility building. There's uh, provides most of the power for the market. So you get a chance to see that on Saturday or anytime you come to the market. Um, anyway, that's all I had. Anybody else have any quick announcements before we get started? Okay, well, um, welcome uh, Peter Carrington. Um, Thank you. Peter and I uh, met, gosh, many, many moons ago. Actually, I think he helped us with one of the energy videos we produced at Urban Options one time, if I'm, my memory serves me, uh, but he, right. he's taught a um, wilderness survival class for over 30 years. He's been the curator of the Beale Botanical Garden at MSU, and he's just a wealth of knowledge. And without further ado, welcome, Peter, and thank you. curious about your presentation, and so am I. <laughs> I've had a few computer hiccups this morning, so I hope this goes more or less smoothly. Um, I guess I'll try to get the first introduction, the introductory slide up just to see. Uh, okay, can anybody see that? Yes, looking good. All right. Well, um, here I go. I'm going to try to talk about some edible and toxic plants. And first, a couple of general points. Uh, there's no extra credit for eating a plant you didn't identify. Or feeding it to your loved ones. Just like there's no extra credit for poisoning anybody. You can landscape with edible plants, but you can also landscape with toxic plants. Probably the most common landscape plant east of the Mississippi is the conifer evergreen bush called yew, Y-E-W. And yew bushes are one of the most toxic plants in the world. The toxins are taxines or taxa, taxanes. This is the genus Taxus, T-A-X-U-S. And most toxins, at least, are initially named after the plants that they come from. The taxanes are sodium channel blockers. And the sodium channel is what runs that little piece of tissue north of the insertion of the aorta on your heart called the sinoatrial node. And the sinoatrial node is the person's natural pacemaker. It actually produces the little electrical signal that tells your heart it's time to beat. And it is a good idea to keep that little bit going as a mammal. Since without a heartbeat, we mammals uh, are something else entirely. So, <clears throat> use if you rem if you recognize them, uh, you you know that that uh, female use their cones actually look like red berries, and when you look at the distal end of the berry, it's actually a hollow that you can look down in, and you can actually see the seed 
sitting at the base of this berry-like arrow. Now, this red berry-like arrow is the only part of this plant that is edible. But I caution everyone to instruct children that they are toxic and not to eat them because that seed that is at the base of the arrow that you can see before you even pick it has a potentially deadly dose of taxane inside. And so if a child ate one and then inadvertently swallowed the seed, it would either be an emergency or a tragedy, depending on whether the seed coat was injured or not. All the rest of this plant is deadly toxic to any mammal. Many tragedies have occurred because someone or some horticulturalist trimmed a yew bush and then threw the trimmings into some animal corral, like a reindeer or horses or goats, and uh, they received a fatal dose of these taxanes and were discovered dead upon the next visit. Okay, uh, I'm going to try to get to the next slide here. Oh, yes. Some of you, or most all of you probably, know on site a very common weed called Queen Anne's Lace. Queen Anne's Lace is literally a wild carrot. That is to say, if backyard genetics experiments was your cup of tea, you could actually start with Queen Anne's lace and breed back to getting a carrot-like vegetable out of it. It's not too hard to get the carrot back, but it's very hard to get the orange back because the orange in our domesticated carrot uh, came from a population tamed in Afghanistan in about the 12th century. So your chances of getting the orange back are very tiny. But my point is, the flower of Queen Anne's lace is a stem which at some point becomes the spot where numerous virtually identical small stems branch off, later holding a little um, set of branches at the end, each of which has a tiny flower. This structure, this architecture, if you will, and I think I might have a picture of one. There we go is uh, what I just described is a simple umble. Now, if that, instead of it ending in a flower, if it ends in another umble, that's called a double umble, uh, as in the drawing that I see on the right of my screen. Uh, you might nod to me if you can actually see this drawing. All right, thank you. This is the archetypal, if you will, architecture of all the flowers in the carrot family. I tell you this because even though many people think they can recognize Queen Anne's lace right off the bat, I counsel you that until you can identify carrot family plants, which I advise you are a very difficult group to identify as a group, even for most botanists, do not go to the carrot family for food. Most of the people I know of who were killed by poison hemlock thought they were gathering Queen Anne's lace at that moment. Uh, poison hemlock, Conium maculatum, is the plant that was used to execute Socrates in 399 BC. In the ancient Greece justice system, it was very often the method used for capital punishment. The alkaloids in this group of plants uh, can be extremely quick acting and severe. Most people go through life thinking, well, I'm just going to eat some random wild plant. The worst that can happen is it'll make me ill and I'll just call somebody and we'll take it from there. But in the carrot family, a number of the toxins are so virulent that you wouldn't even have time to make a cell phone call before you were incapacitated and shortly after relieved of your life in the physical. So my, uh, my point is, 
don't gather carrot family things until you have experience and confidence in your abilities to identify these extremely dangerous plants. You don't get more than one mistake in many cases. Uh, this is to show you the definition of, uh, of a pinnately compound leaf. A palmately compound leaf is where the leaflets attach similar in basic concept geometrically to the way your fingers attach to the palm of your hand. Uh, pinna is the Latin word for feather. And so when you see the single pinnate compound leaf there on the left, you can see that if those were not leaflets, but in fact barbs of a feather, it would reflect the true architecture that bird feathers present. Singly pinnate, each one is a leaf, each piece is a leaflet. In the doubly pinnate, the single leaflet is replaced by yet another pinnate structure. So that's doubly pinnate. And this would be the architecture of, say, a Kentucky coffee tree, for instance which we mostly have as horticulture items around here. Kentucky coffee trees used to be used to brew a kind of wild coffee. I do not counsel that as a good idea because the seeds contain a toxic amino acid called cysteine, which does not work well for mammals. Here we have a couple of our most dangerous common carrot family plants. On the left, is poison hemlock, the one that was used to execute Socrates. On the right is water hemlock, my personal candidate for most toxic plant in all of North America. A very common Michigan plant, especially where soil remains moist for long periods of time. And like I say, most people who have been poisoned with poison hemlock the plant on the left, thought they were gathering Queen Anne's lace at the time. And you can see the apparent similarity of the flower clusters. On the right, water hemlock. As a doctor or a veterinarian, you hardly ever have, have a case come in where you have an opportunity to save the life of the person or animal who ate it, because it usually kills so quickly that... Uh, you, all you ever see are the results of a fatality and not an active case that you as a caregiver can interact with. Water hemlock has one physical feature that makes it sort of unique and gives people identifying it a bit of a break. And that is uh, I, on one of these uh, photographs, or excuse me, on one of the plants in the picture on the right, you can see a dark area in the middle toward the top on the left side of the picture where you get a feeling for the appearance of the leaflets having serrated edges. Now, most plants on planet Earth with serrated edges, the vein of the leaf that supports that portion of the leaf blade goes right out to the tip of the serration. So that sharp the sharp tip that makes each one of the points has a little vein that goes right to the tip. And almost the vast majority of plants with serrated edges on planet Earth are constructed this way. But in this particular species, the vein comes and enters, uh, reaches the margin of the leaf at the notch, not at the tip of the serration. That's a very rare characteristic, and it gives you an opportunity uh, to save your life if you're thinking about making a fatal mistake. The toxin here is uh, named again after the plant. It's called cicutoxin. It is one of the most toxic alkaloids known on planet Earth, and it is a convulsant. So convulsions start sometime within. 90 seconds of eating the plant. And at that point, you are probably not able to make a cell phone call. It is equally virulent to all other mammals as well. So 
if you have stock of any kind that are pastured in a field that has a stream running through it, it's always a good idea to inspect the margins of that stream to make sure there's no water hemlock growing there. Are there any questions at this moment? I can only see four of you. So if you have a question and I can't see you, uh, jump up and down or set off some fireworks or something. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Um, you'll pop right up to the top of the list. I'm sensing a, a deer management strategy here. <laughs> I'm afraid deer have evolved alongside these plants so long that I've never heard of one of them making a fatal mistake. Well, carry on. Thank you. I was, if I, <clears throat> I have more a comment than a question, but I was uh, walking at Hawk Island back when the, these would have been blooming. And I, I think what I saw along the edges around the lake, what I thought it was poison hemlock, but it might've been water hemlock out there as well, but there was a oh, ton yeah. of it. Yes, uh, it's a, these are quite common plants. Um, my wife and I often drive to the Holt market on Saturday mornings. And one morning we were driving there and I, happened to mention this huge thicket of poison hemlock growing right next to the road. And Linda suggested, well, shouldn't we tell somebody about this? And I said, well, the problem with that strategy is that it is such a common plant, we will have to be making calls the whole way. And sure enough, as we drove on, we passed at least a dozen other thickets of poison hemlock growing freely at the edge of the road. Our credit union has a branch on Marsh Road with an ATM. And when you're at the ATMs, you can see a large thicket of poison hemlock uh, growing right there. Oddly enough, the uh, group of people who uh, have vocally advocated for the rights of seniors to commit suicide, uh, their group is called the Hemlock Society. And I was uh, humorously noting that the Bertram Hills Retirement Home has several very large colonies of poison hemlock growing right next to the paved driveway uh, as you drive around the property, uh, which I think is an accident. There we have it. But like I say, if you avoid the carrot family until you're really good at it, um, you have every chance of uh, surviving your edible plant adventures. One of the characteristics of poison hemlock that are most diagnostic are that main stems and even the large petioles of the leaves, the rachis, if you will, of the compound leaf, look like they have been spattered with irregular purple stains. They also have a kind of musky smell. Nobody ever picked poison hemlock for a bouquet, even if they didn't know what it, what it was, because it smells pretty rank. Now, if you look at a Queen Anne's lace flower from the side, you will see underneath the actual flower bearing parts of the umbel, you'll see underneath little structures that look like they might have been leaves. They are somewhat branched and they usually curve down away from the upward curving branches of the umbel itself. These are called sterile bracts and uh, they are a clear and obvious feature in a Queen Anne's lace flower. And it helps you immediately to know that uh, this is not poison hemlock when you see it. Peter, there's a question in the chat about from Tom Frazier. Is hemlock only deadly if it's eaten or can breathing the air when pulling it be harmful? I've never heard of a respiratory uh, exposure. Okay, thank you. 
there are some people who advocate that as a, if you're pulling it as a common weed, you might want to have gloves on. But I've never heard of a dermal exposure either. It's almost always something that the person or creature has eaten. Oddly enough, there is a group of insects who specialize in this plant. And it is called the poison hemlock moth. And if you are growing them for trophy specimens, they might eat lots of the leaves on your poison hemlock. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Are we doing okay for time so far? Yeah, we're doing great. Um, okay. um, we, if you want to go another 10 minutes or so or whatever you sure. need and then uh, sure. kind of open it up for more questions. Absolutely. This little slide here is about the Eastern water hemlock and it is in the wild, almost always found on more or less permanently wet ground. So uh, when I go to a wetland at the Rose Lake Wildlife Area, it is very often a commonly presented weed in that environment. And it gets about five feet tall on occasion, although many specimens are much smaller. There's one other poison water hemlock that I did not include in the presentation that has very finely cut lacy ferny type leaves. And it is called bulb bearing hemlock, Secuta bulbifera, which is literally a translation of bulb bearing in Latin. And again, as long as you stay out of the carrot family, you're good. Those are our two most toxic plants, probably, uh, in the whole area. And a good, a good reason not to guess, especially in a wetland and especially uh, if you're looking at carrot-like plants. Okay, what I have on the screen that I hope you can see is a flowering redbud tree. Redbuds are in the pea family. They are a popular ornamental. They have sweet smelling, gorgeous pink or, pink or white flowers, depending on what variety is in front of you. And uh, they have delicious flowers, which I eat bunches of every spring. This is what the pods look like. And at this age, the pods are about an inch or an inch and a quarter long. And these pods have been used as food, both as pickles and as a stir fry component. In Florida, one of the common names for red bud is salad tree. Every now and again, you'll see an edible plant book that rep recommends an endangered species as a food item. And I, of course, counsel you that if you uh, take an interest in such a plant, that you should be cultivating this plant before you're digging it up and eating it. Our native plants are an excellent source of edible wild plants, and so are weeds. When you have a uh, disturbed area like a garden, and it comes up in hundreds of seedling weeds, many of those weeds can be probably edible plants. I counsel you again, there's no extra credit for not identifying something you're going to eat. And even a weed patch, uh, even if it was a uh, garden last year, uh, when it comes up in the spring as weeds, there's no guarantees that there won't be a number of toxic plants in the mix. So even if your 
visiting the weed patch that came up after last year's garden, it's still important to know the characteristics and identify correctly the stuff that you are planning to either eat or feed to your loved ones. Every now and again, someone approaches me with a rule, you know, like all plants that have this and this are edible. There is no such rule for determining edible and toxic plants. And that goes triple for mushrooms. Many people have this idea that if the mushroom separate, if the skin of the mushroom separates from the flesh of the mushroom easily, that defines an edible mushroom. And it does not. And of course, as you know, the penalties for a mess up in the mushroom world can be quite severe. There's a famous edible plant story about a family who used to cook wild mushrooms and their technique was to feed it to the cat first. And if the cat was okay, they'd be so the family gets uh, a bunch of wild mushrooms and they feed it to the cat. And it appears the cat goes almost immediately into convulsions. So they throw out all of the mushrooms that they've cooked and they go out to the doctor and he can't find anything wrong with them. So they come back and they find the cat behind the couch has had kittens. Oh, well. So like I say, there's absolutely no way to distinguish edible and toxic plants or mushrooms en masse by some rule. Those rules are always defective. And if you get the exception to the very defective rules, uh, then you are, of course, <laughs> at the front lines of human toxicology, which is not a good place to be, <laughs> especially not because you messed up and fed it to your loved ones. <laughs> Thanks. Good joke. Thank you. Excuse me? Good joke. Thank you, Peter. Oh, anytime. <laughs> okay, on the screen right now are four of the most common weeds that come when you break up ground for a garden. Many of you probably recognize lamb's quarters when it comes up. Lamb's quarters, Kenopodium album, is a famous food plant that has figured in the food history of human beings for millennia. They are a non-poisonous plant except under the circumstance where they grow in a cultivated field runoff or on a compost heap. And the problem is when they get too much nitrogen, they make nitrates. And nitrates are not a good part of the diet for mammals. Nitrates tend to form compounds that influence the blood and especially transform hemoglobin out of being hemoglobin into a compound called methemoglobin. Methemoglobin is great stuff, except it does not carry oxygen. So it... Uh, so it is not a vitamin. These two pictures are pictures of large lamb's quarters. Notice the stems when they get large have colorful vertical ribs on them. They may be green or they may be purple or they may be red. This family, the lamb's quarters family, no longer exists as a recognized family. It has been subsumed into the amaranth family. So the Kenopodiaceae is now part of the amaranthaceae. These plants are used when they're young as a boiled herb. This is the same family as domesticated spinach. So when it first comes up in the spring, you can take the young shoots, harvest them, knock off any insects or raccoons, and uh, serve them as a boiled or steamed vegetable. Uh, one of my favorites, actually. 
when the plant is mature and you see the photograph on the left, that is a flowering shoot of lamb's quarters. Ultimately, those round structures that show a few anthers on them will become almost spherical. And if you rub them between your fingers when they're mature in the fall, black or dark reddish brown seeds will appear. These seeds have been harvested as food for many millennia. If you've ever heard the term bog people, people who were buried in bogs, either executed in bogs or buried there after their natural departure, uh, bogs being a natural and large source of tannins. And of course, tannins, tannic acid, is how you go from dead cow to leather coat. And people are tanned the same way if you bury them in a bog. And one of the consequences of bog burials is stomach contents are often preserved. And if you remember back to the issue of National Geographic magazine from 1949, I'm sure you all remember that one, uh, there's a picture of a bog individual named Toland Mann by the people who discovered it. And his stomach contents at the time of his death were almost entirely a meal of lamb's quarters seeds. I think it's curious that Napoleon Bonaparte was highly revered by the officer corps for his ability to make delicious muffins or biscuits from lamb's quarters seed. And his technique was to roast the seeds in an oven at about 275 degrees for about 40 minutes before he ground them and used them for flour. It drives off a sort of what they describe as mousy smell from the seeds. So next time you join up with Napoleon, don't forget the biscuits. This is what lamb's quarters looks like right after the flowers have reached anthesis. These flowers are sort of wilting now, and you can see why they never caught on in the corsage industry. But anyway, these little round structures made of five sepals folded in are where the seed is produced. The fruits do not, as they say, dehiss on their own. So when you're harvesting the fruits, you're harvesting these round ball-like structures that you have to rub or something to get the sepals off of and expose the shiny black seed underneath. This is what lamb's quarters, white lamb's quarters, uh, the Latin name Kinopodium album, album means white. And here's what gives it the name. This mealy-like texture on the surface of the leaves that is white in color. Now, some lamb's quarters, this white mealy texture is actually not white, but purple. There is a species called Kinopodium giganteum, which has purple instead of white. I don't have any micrographs or scans of these leaves to show you, but if I did, the texture of those inner leaves there would look like a landscape on which someone had discarded a myriad of milk glass white bowling balls all over the landscape. But anyway, it helps you identify them on some occasions. This is the family that uh, Lamb's Quarters is now part of, the Amaranth family. And of course, their flowers, as you see on the left, are extremely spiky, which means that when these plants mature their seeds and dry out, they're quite uncomfortable to grasp in your bare hands. The new growth of regular amaranths and Lamb's Quarters are both delicious as boiled or steamed vegetables, although lamb's quarters can also be eaten raw as a salad. And the ripe seeds of amaranth have been used as a grain for many millennia. 
in fact, the word amaranth is derived from a Greek term, which means live forever, and referred to the fact that the ancients saw this plant, especially its seeds, as the ultimate health food. And they were grown as a almost commercial farm product amongst not only Native Americans, but also indigenous peoples of the Himalaya as well. I'm sure the plant on the left, a mature amaranth, the seeds is probably uh, generally familiar in its appearance, since again, this is one of the most common plants that comes up in disturbed or broken ground. The plant on the right is a young amaranth, probably still tender enough to be used as a boiled or steamed vegetable. And they're quite delicious, I would add. This plant is purslane, a, th a succulent, thick-stemmed weed with a rather leathery texture of leaves that are themselves succulent and full of water content. And these are a delicious salad, also as a boiled or steamed vegetable. But they are so good in salads that most people I know who eat them wouldn't bother cooking them because they are so delicious fresh. Are there any questions yet? Well, I don't see any on the three people I have displayed here. So with that, I will take the next one. This is a close-up of purslane showing one of its yellow flowers. In my experience, these yellow flowers open at about 8.30 in the morning during the prime of summer, and they close before noon. Took me years to figure that out because I was always trying to get flower pictures for my edible plant lectures, and I was always either too early or too late. But ultimately, I did make that discovery. And there's a close-up of one of its flowers. Five-petaled, rather waxy yellow flowers open on a sunny morning at about 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, this slide uh, is a discussion about a plant that is not related, but yet many people find it sufficiently similar looking to purslane that a confusion sometimes occurs. This is Euphorbia maculata, sometimes named Camisyche maculata, and it is a Euphorbia, and all Euphorbias tend to have when injured or have a leaf plucked off to reveal milky white sap, sort of Elmer's glue consistency. As a basic concept, milky sap is something to not eat generally. Whenever you see a plant with milky sap, check your resources and make sure you're not making a mistake because very few plants with edible sap are desirable food. In the case of euphorbia, a sap is acrid, and so they taste terrible. Some euphorbias are also uh, contact carcinogens. Uh, one of them in particular, grown as an indoor plant called the African milk bush, euphorbia tirucali, can literally cause skin cancers by repeated exposure to the sap. So I generally do not recommend eating euphorbia plants. Their main toxin is considered to be the four ball esters that they produce. But like I say, milky, plant, milky sap plants are not a good plan until you recognize exactly where the edges of edibility lie because most of them are not food. And purslane, if you think you've got it, tastes pretty good. It's not acid, it's not acrid, and the sap is clear. 
This is that euphorbia I was talking about that resembles purslane. It crawls along the ground in flat sort of rosettes in the same way as purslane. Most of them, when they get to maturity in the middle of summer, have a purple mark in the middle of the leaves that you see on the plant on the left. And that's what gives the plant its Latin name maculata. Maculata means with this marking. And like I said, these are all milky sap euphorbias. The flower there and the picture on the right is about, is between a 16th and an eighth of an inch in diameter. So you can certainly see how it never caught on in the corsage industry. This is a common weed in the tomato family. The tomato family, of course, is also the nightshade family. And long recognized that many dangerous plants grow in this family. This group, the genus Solanum, which also includes tomatoes and potatoes, are, are toxic by virtue of a class of toxins called glycoalkaloids. These would include solanine, harnine, and choconine. Now this plant has a reputation as being used as a leafy vegetable, as a boiled or steamed vegetable in the Caribbean and in North Africa. But I do not advocate using it for that because those areas, in areas that use this as a vegetable, have uh, unexpectedly high lever levels of esoph esophageal cancer, um, which seems to be a possibility of trying to eat uh, the solanine and the choconine components of these plants. Many people believe that if you take a glycoalkaloid bearing plant, and probably the most famous example are green tomatoes, and cook them like fried green tomatoes, you will modify the glycoalkaloid. But uh, a scientist whose last name is Friedman, spelt fried man, uh, actually has experimented extensively on glycoalkaloids. And the results of his work show that there's nothing you can do in an ordinary kitchen that will change the structure of a glycoalkaloid. They survive boiling, freezing, drying, deep frying, microwaving. Now, if you have nuclear weapons in your kitchen, there are some things that haven't been tried yet, but uh, I strongly recommend against detonating any such uh, device <laughs> near any anybody or anything you want to save. So glycoalkaloids, you can generally count on the fact that no amount of cooking or processing will change the structure of the glycoalkaloids. And they are, uh, they are toxic. And some of them are actually neurotoxic. Some of them uh, mimic the effect of steroids in some cases. This is what the black nightshade flower looks like, a typical tomato family flower with five petals and the anthers consolidated into a almost like a peak in the center of the flower. You'll recognize this structure if you look back in your memory at when you were looking at your tomato plants in flower as well. Uh, am I out of time? No. Um, we'll probably uh, take a, a brief pause towards the end of the hour just to, for more questions or follow-up comments. Okay. Um, it's unfair to condense several um, <clears throat> lifetimes worth of information into one hour here, but you're doing a great job. Thank you, oh, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> Try not to have too many people uh, fall off the edge of their computer table, uh, trying to endure the length of the presentation. This is one of our most common weeds called curled dock. This is in the rhubarb family. And like rhubarb, it is endowed with a serious amount 
of what we call uh, oxalates. Oxalates derive from the oxalic acid in plants of the genus oxalis. It is the simplest of the dicarboxylic acids, that is COOH. Two COOHs together make oxalic acid. Oxalic acid is eagerly combines with calcium, which means that if you eat too much oxalic acid, if it combines with calcium in your body, it makes a non-water -solu non soluble crystal called calcium oxalate. About 70% of human kidney stones are calcium oxalate. So if you have a personal or family history of kidney stones, you will probably want to at least keep track of, if not limit extensively, the amount of oxalic acid you intentionally ingest. This particular plant, the new growth, the new leaves you see here, this is the second year of this plant. And it, so it came, came up in the spring. This is a late April, early May picture. And uh, these leaves, especially the young tender ones in the middle can be used as a salad. And they taste a little bit sour because the oxalic acid uh, gives a kind of lemony tang to the flavor. Some people find this desirable, and especially if you want to make an edible wild salad and you didn't bring salad dressing, that lemony flavor uh, can contribute to your enjoyment of the so-called salad. But like I, like I say, if you eat too much of this stuff, oxalic acid becomes a challenge to your kidneys. And so you're going to want to not live off this plant exclusively or extensively for any length of time because of that. When this plant grows up and ripens the flower stalk into seeds, as you see on the right, the seeds themselves extracted from the uh, calyx of the flowers that you see on the left are compared to the size, uh, that is a Roosevelt dime that you see on the left edge of the left picture gives you an idea that these seeds, while they look almost identical to buckwheat, they are considerably smaller, but yet you can use them in the exact same way as you use buckwheat seed. You can make buckwheat flour pancakes or any number of things from this. Here, we had a quick question in the chat. Okay. Have you written a book that discusses today's information or is there a book you would recommend to start with? Well, the uh, starter book I would recommend is in the Peterson Field Guide series. Roger Torrey Peterson's eldest son, Lee, wrote a book called The Field Guide to Edible Wild Plants. And it is a good introduction. What about poison? Uh, as far as poison plants go as a separate concept, uh, the best book on the toxic plants of North America is uh, Toxic Plants of North America by uh, Tyrrell, T-Y-R-L, and Burroughs. It's an expensive, large book, but it is wonderfully exhaustive. And I'm writing a book on the toxic plants of Eastern North America myself. Uh, and I use it as my primary reference, uh, but with many others. We are closing in on the hour here. I'm just okay. wondering, um, hate to cut you off, Peter. Maybe we can have you back um, at a future dialogue. Um, I would be very happy to. And but, thank you for cutting me off or you're all still alive. <laughs> well, you're not totally cut off yet, but are there any <laughs> uh, other comments, questions, or insights related to this or semi-related that anyone wants to share? Sam. Yeah, uh, just a question going back to the beginning of this. 
Well, this is all really good, but um, I couldn't stop thinking about the uh, those little orils, um, that whatever I guess they're the cones or whatever they are on the yew plant. Yes, and um, I'm just curious about the. It sounded like there might be a degree of toxicity with that seed, and Very just much. wondering is so if you're you know if you're a little kid and you had uh, some of those in your mouth but spit them out would that could that potentially be um a, a long-term effect in other words something that doesn't like knock you over right that day but you know how people tend to get afib later in life is could this be something that maybe causes some early damage and lingers and shows up later well it's certainly a good question but i have never seen it answered in any way in the written accounts of any of it. Uh, generally speaking, the red arrow, which when you bite into it is sort of slimy and extremely sweet. Yep. Uh, has never been associated with any health problems that I have read about. But the seed is clearly toxic. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't know of any long-term health exposures based on minuscule amounts that have not yet been detected in the arrows themselves. Okay. Just does I can sort of remember uh sampling those fruits, you know, when I might have been five years old or something. And uh sure. pretty sure I spit out the seeds. <laughs> right. Yeah, we had a dog once. You know, and dogs learn berry picking from people. We had a dog once who ate them with abandon, and his poop looked like almost entirely closest pack arrangements of yew seeds on occasion. But he never showed any ill effects that I know of. Hmm. I'm glad you asked that question, Sam. That's quite a relief. Oh, yeah. Having a, grown up in a house surrounded by yew plants. Um, Brian, did you have a question or anybody else? I have any questions because I spent so much time taking notes. This is amazing. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. And I, I look forward and to another session. Peter, can I actually ask you a plant-related question? It doesn't have to do with this, but you brought up rhubarb. Yes. Is that, a, is that considered to be a wetland or an upland plant? Well, uh, it actually uh, does not seem to do very well in the wild of North America. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, there's wild rhubarb back there, but I've never, ever seen it. The, por the person who said, oh, the woods is full of wild rhubarb, when I got back in there and saw the plants they were talking about, they were talking yeah. about burdock. Burdock. Burdock leaves, yeah. So those are big green leaves with kind of the purple stems? Uh, often purple stems, not always. Is that uh, a wetland sort of, plant? And sort of a downy, fuzzy back underside of the leaf. Okay. Uh, there's okay. nothing toxic that I know of about burdock. Is it a wetland uh, plant? No. Or an, it is no, not? It's an, okay. it's an everywhere plant. Oh, and everywhere. Okay. In in, in the seeds, um, will stick to you. You'll you'll be uh, carrying those seeds all over the place. They stick to your genes. Got yes, it. the seeds were literally the inspiration for the invention of Velcro. <laughs> hmm. And uh, if you go out in the late summer and fall, uh, you, your socks, and your dog will be covered with them. Um, I don't know anything you can just outright eat on a burdock burr. The seeds inside could be germinated for sprouts, but that's a whole other matter. Uh, Kim uh, or Bruce had a question. Good. Hey, Peter, I would, um, this is all really interesting and I'm really regretting that I never found the time to take your class when I was in school and that um do they still does anybody still offer any type of um a class like you did back in the day not that i know of 
I retired in 2013 from LCC and uh, I don't think anyone has picked up either of those classes since. That's a shame. Thank you. Could be your calling, Kim. Oh no, I don't think I, I don't have time to learn as much as Peter seems to know just off the top of his head. Thank you. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, planting native plants and pollinators. Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, natives versus non-natives? And um, there's also a lot of fervor about uh, invasive species. Um, any a brief sh thoughts you'd like to share on any of those topics? Well, invasive species can uh, actually be very important. And uh, I think uh, discouraging them in favor of native plants is always a good plan. For me, when it comes to having plants in the yard, uh, one of the things that I'm always hoping to maximize are the presence of really great insects. And all the great insects found around here are native. And so when you plant native plants, you get native insects. And when you get lots of native insects, you get a lot more happy native birds, all of which is a good plan in my world. Um, some invasive species are of course toxic. There are some native species that are invasive also, but they tend not to dominate the landscape as a monoculture the way many invasive plants do. For instance, if you know the invasive plant called smooth buckthorn, smooth buckthorn, when you drive past a native uh, woodland in the fall, if you can see into it, along about Halloween, uh, all the native plants have lost their leaves. And all you can look through this woodlot and you look in there and you can see a whole other forest canopy about seven or eight feet tall, made of these invasive woody buckthorns. And uh, the first time I ever saw common buckthorn, Ramnus cathartica, and they don't have the name cathartica for nothing. If you eat a berry, you get to have a cathartic experience. And that is not a good thing. The first time I ever saw one of these bushes, I looked at the, the venation of the leaves and the horizontal lenticels on the bark, and I thought, well, this must be some kind of weird wild cherry I never saw before. And I picked one of the ripe berries and I put it in my mouth. I didn't eat it, but even just having the juice of it in my mouth, I was spitting for the next half hour. And so I counsel you that... Uh, Buckthorns, which are sometimes listed as mildly toxic, uh, if, if eating a lot of them is major toxic, I can't imagine anyone eating a lot of them unless they've lost their sense of smell in the war or something. Because as far as something that tastes bad, I recommend common buckthorn as the archetypal worst flavor in the vegetable world that I have ever sampled. And it is an invasive woody plant capable of taking over vast swaths of territory, including a good part of my yard. Um, they grow into a tree. The only place I've ever seen them full grown is at MSU in that little tiny spat of forest that's growing right adjacent, sort of to the west side of the Simon power plant. There are common buckthorns in there, five and six inches in diameter, which is the largest I've ever seen on planet Earth. And uh, like I say, they're extremely invasive. They spread from birds. Birds apparently have no sense of taste. And so they eat these berries, even though it's definitely in the how good can you take a joke column. Uh, but still, uh, they come up from bird poop by the millions every year. Well, Are there any other comments and questions? I hope that was a good answer. <laughs> well, we, we certainly filled filled this hour with a lot of juicy information. 
<laughs> Juicy, that's good. Um, and humor. <laughs> thank you, Peter, for joining us and everyone for tuning in. Um, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I am uh, more than happy to do this. And uh, and again, if you ever have uh, want to get into a different swath of plants. Great. Um, well, everybody have a great week. And um, yeah, unless there's other comments, I think we'll tune off for now. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. You very much. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much.